Hello, everyone, and welcome to fellowseminar.org. Um, uh, here we are. Hold on. Uh, yes, the current theme is branch specific diversification inference, by which I mean learning about the diversification process via phylogenetics. If this is macroevolution, then we're talking about speciation and, and extinction rates. And if this is microevolution, then we're talking about fitness estimation. If you want to ask a question, you can either tweet at Phyloseminar or type your question in the live chat box to the right of the video on YouTube. Today's speaker is David Rasmussen. David develops and applies phylogenetic methods for tracking the spread of pathogens through genomic sequence data. He did his PhD with Katya Kowal at Duke University and then a postdoc with Tanya Stadler at ETH Zurich. David joined NC State in Emerging Plant Disease and Global Food Security in 2018, and is actually a returning customer for a fellow seminar, having given a talk in 2014 about statistical inference for fellow dynamics. Welcome, David, and thanks for participating. Yeah, thanks for having, having me a second time, Eric. It's nice to be invited back to do another phylo seminar. Um, so going along with the current theme of the phylo seminars on branch-specific diversification rates and fitness inference, uh, today, I thought I would talk a little bit about my work with Tanya Stadler on trying to incorporate um, adaptive molecular evolution into uh, phylodynamic models for uh, microbial evolution. Uh, so in, in phylodynamics, what we're generally interested in is how different ecological or evolutionary processes uh, act to shape the phylogenetic history of pathogens. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be a pathogen, it could be any organism, and I think a lot of what I'll talk about today could, in theory, also be applied to uh, macroevolutionary processes at the, the species level or higher, um, but I'm going to retain the focus on pathogens today and talk about how we can infer pathogen fitness from uh, pathogen genomic data. Um, so in phylodynamics, really what we're interested in is uh, why pathogen phylogenies look the way that they do. Why, for example, does the measles phylogeny, like the one shown here on the left of the screen, look so different and balanced uh, in contrast to uh, the human influenza H3N2 phylogeny, which just has this highly uh, spindly looking phylogeny with lots of clay turnover through time. Similarly, we can ask why does an HIV phylogeny of viruses sampled at the population level look so different from an HIV phylogeny sampled uh, with viruses sampled at the within host level? And the answer really in both of these cases is that it's really selection acting on, in the case of both uh, influenza and HIV, antigenic escape mutations. And so it's the continual process of evolution finding new antigenic escape mutations and then selection acting on those mutations, which leads to this uh, dramatic turnover and diversity through time in these, these trees. Uh, we can contrast this to what phylodynamic or phylogenetic methods are, are typically used for in um, molecular epidemiology and uh, the population genetics of, of pathogens. Most of the time, uh, what we do with these phylodynamic methods is we're interested in reconstructing the past, but generally uh, neutral ecological dynamics or neutral demographic processes. Um, so using methods like the, the coalescent, um, we can use phylodynamic methods to reconstruct historical population dynamics, um, or we can use methods like the structured coalescent to uh, incorporate geographic or other forms of population structure and then this would allow us to infer how individuals are moving back and forth between different populations uh, and estimate migration rates. Um, so these are some of the things that current phylodynamic methods really do well. Um, one thing that current phylodynamic methods do not do well, although arguably we can make uh, a much longer list, is to incorporate uh, non-neutral genetic variation that really considers that uh, fitness might vary dramatically across the different lineages in uh, a pathogen phylogeny. Um, and this is something we'd really like to be able to do because I don't think many of us would be all that interested in these rapidly evolving pathogens if they didn't have the ability to actually uh, adapt and escape things like host immunity or escape selection pressures 
due to, for example, antimicrobial drugs. Um, so it's kind of ironic to some extent that um, adaptive evolution really hasn't been incorporated into these phylogenetic or phylodynamic models. Um, and I think this has frustrated a lot of people over the years, um, including me. Um, and this is a problem that I've thought about for many years. And so today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, one approach that I came up with uh, working with Tanya Stadler at ETH Zurich on how we could incorporate uh, adaptive molecular evolution into these models. Um, but first, I think it's worth asking why it's been so difficult to incorporate uh, adaptive or non-neutral evolution into uh, phylogenetic methods. And the short answer is just that it's hard. Many different approaches have been presented in the literature. There's, of course, older work on things like the ancestral selection graph, which incorporated uh, selection into coalescent models. Um, but basically what we've run against uh, time and time again is that most phylogenetic models that we commonly use assume this basic uh, structure or, or dependency structure um, where uh, at, to really simplify things, we assume that there's some underlying replication process, which by individuals in a population uh, replicate or reproduce themselves. And this replication process itself gives rise to a, a branching process which generates uh, a tree or a phylogenetic tree. And then along the lineages of this phylogeny, there's uh, a mutation or substitution process that causes the sequence of lineages to change through time. And this gives rise to the sequences that we can then observe at the tips of the phylogeny. Um, what most of these models assume, though, is that the mutation process is independent of the underlying replication process. Uh, so another way of saying this is basically that there's no feedback between the changes in sequences and the replication process, such that if a beneficial or deleterious mutation occurs in the sequence of a particular lineage in a phylogeny, the fitness of that mutation does not um, feed back and affect the underlying replication process that's giving rise to the tree. Um, and we make this in the independence assumption between the mutation process and the tree generating process, because if we do, uh, we wind up with statistically tractable models. So if, for example, in phylogenetics, typically what we want to do is be able to compute the joint likelihood of both uh, a phylogenetic tree, T, and the sequence data that we observe at the tips, S. Um, and if we make this independence assumption, then we can factor this joint likelihood into two uh, simpler likelihood terms that we know how to compute. So we can uh, factor the joint likelihood of both the sequence data and the tree into a likelihood of the sequence data given the tree, which we can, for example, compute um, using the Felsenstein pruning algorithm. This is basically what all modern phylogenetic uh, programs that use likelihood uh, do. Um, and another term that gives us the likelihood, or uh, in the Bayesian context, the prior probability of the tree given some demographic parameters, which we could compute, for example, for example under a coalescent model or a birth-death model. Um, but this assumption about the independence between the mutation process and the tree gener generating process isn't ne necessarily very biologically realistic. Um, as we can see, even by considering very simple population genetic models where we have non-neutral uh, mutations uh, circulating in the population. So for example, if we consider a simple model with uh, mutation load whereby lineages can accumulate uh, deleterious mutations through time, we can see that the mutation process itself starts to shape the, the branching structure of the under, underlying phylogeny. So here I've uh, shown this phylogeny that was simulated. Um, lineages that have a higher deleterious mutation load are in warmer colors, like this lineage here. And lineages with fewer deleterious mutations are in darker or uh, cooler colors, like the blue. And what we can see in this phylogeny is that the less fit mutations carrying more deleterious mutations uh, actually branch less and leave behind fewer sample descendants than the more fit lineages carrying uh, fewer mutations, which actually branch more and leave behind more sample descendants. So I think this shows us two things. Um, 
One, that the mutation process itself can actually shape the branching structure of our phylogeny. And two, that if we were somehow able to take into account the, the branching structure of the phylogeny, we could actually potentially infer or estimate um, the fitness of particular lineages from the branching structure of the phylogeny. Um, one way we could start to go about doing this is with so-called multi-type birth death models. Um, so birth death models, including the multi-type birth death models, uh, have a long history in mathematical biology going back to uh, at least the 1940s. Um, but it was really the work of Tanya Stadler um, at ETH Zurich in the past decade or so that really allowed these multi-type birth death models to be applied to the situations we commonly deal with in phylogenetics where we have incomplete uh, phylogenetic trees because we, necess we haven't necessarily sampled uh, everybody or all taxa in a, in a population. Um, and what we can do under these multi-type birth death models is compute the joint likelihood that a tree together with the genotype data at a single locus or single evolving character has evolved under uh, a birth death model. And conceptually, these models are quite simple because only one of four things can really happen along each lineage in the phylogeny. So we can have uh, a birth event or a branching event in the phylogeny. If we're thinking about an infectious pathogen, these birth events could correspond to a transmission event between hosts. Uh, we have a, a death event. Um, and it's important to note here that lineages uh, can die before that we, we've, we've had time to sample them, in which case we would uh, have this unobserved lineage in the phylogeny that we, we didn't sample. Um, we can have uh, a sampling event, um, either at present or at some time in the past, at which point we would observe uh, the genotype of that lineage or the, or the character state. And finally, we would have mutation events by which the genotype of the lineage would change at some point in time. And what we can do under these multi-type birth death models is we can couple uh, transitions in, in state through mutation events to changes in fitness along a particular lineage in the tree. So as a lineage changes between, for example, different nucleotides at a particular site in its sequence, the fitness of that lineage in terms of its birth or death rate could also change by going up and down over time. And the really nice thing about these multi-type birth death models is they allow us, um, again, to compute the likelihood of uh, the phylogeny and the tip states having evolved under uh, this birth death model. Um, and actually what we can do is we can write down a system of ordinary differential equations for the probability density, dNi, for what this probability density represents is then the likelihood of a lineage um, producing the um, producing the tree or sub subtree or lineage exactly uh, as we observe in the phylogeny. And I admit these these ODEs don't look particularly nice, um, but they're they're actually quite simple in in some regard because actually what we're doing is just accounting for all the different events that could have occurred along a particular lineage in the phylogeny. For example, the first term here in the ODD corresponds to the probability that no birth, migration, or death events occurred along a particular lineage. And then what this term uh, combined reflects is how the probability density of a particular lineage changes due to the fact that none of these events have occurred. And likewise, we can also take into account um, the fact that a particular lineage could have given birth to a new lineage, but that lineage might not have uh, given rise to any sampled ancestors because there's some probability, EI, that those uh, descendant lineages um, uh, were never sampled. So then if we track this probability density, DNI, of, for the probability density of the, the observed tree going all the way back to the root, um, we can actually then sum over all possible root states, i, at the root of the tree, and actually this probability density gives us the joint likelihood that we actually want. It allows us con to compute uh, the joint likelihood of the sequence states observed at the tips as well as the, the phylogeny. Um, 
But at more than one uh, evolving character state, or if you want to consider an alignment of uh, sequences where you have multiple different sites, in order to extend this multi-type birth death model to um, one of those cases, what we would have to be able to do is be able to track the evolutionary dynamics of all possible genotypes. And the number of possible genotypes grows um, exponentially with the, the number of sites in our alignment. And this means that the multi-type birth death model becomes basically prohibitively computationally expensive for anything more than just a few um, evolving sites. So the solution that Tanya and I um, came up with is uh, to make a, a few approximations that, that simplifies things by eliminating the need to track all possible genotypes um, in sequence space uh, and continue to track uh, molecular evolution at each uh, site uh, pseudo-independently. So we call this the, the marginal fitness birth death model. Um, and what we do under this model is we track molecular evolution at each site by computing the marginal site probability, what we'll call omega, that a particular site is in a particular state or, or genotype. This could be a nucleotide or an amino acid. Um, and then once we have those site probabilities, the omegas, we can then approximate the probability of a lineage being in a particular genotypes based on the, the marginal site probabilities. So for example, if we want to compute or approximate the probability that a particular lineage N has the genotype ACT, we can multiply together the probability of that lineage being in state A at site 1, state C at site 2, and state T at site 3. Um, but this is actually making uh, a pretty big assumption here. What we're assuming here is that each site is evolving um, independently, which isn't necessarily true because there can be correlations among sites due to things like uh, selection. So just to give you a brief example of why um, evolution at different sites might, might not be completely independent, we, consider, we can consider a very simple model where we have just two evolving sites uh, with each uh, just a simple binary character state of a zero or one uh, genotype at each site. Um, and so we have four, over four overall possible genotypes, uh, genotypes 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. Um, and let's say for the sake of example that the 1, 1 genotype, the double mutant, actually has the highest possible fitness, possibly due to an epistatic interaction between mutations. If we tracked the probability of a lineage being in each possible genotype backwards through time under this model with selection, we might see that this lineage, for example, has a high number of branching events along it, and so a high number of sample descendants. Therefore, under our model, the probability of the lineage being in the most fit state, 1-1, one, one, would be much higher relative to our uh, approximate model, which tracks each site uh, pseudo-independently. Um, so we do expect there to be minor deviations between uh, the genotype probabilities that we would uh, compute if we tracked um, them exactly by tracking all possible genotypes in sequence space versus under our marginal fitness model, where we compute genotype probabilities um, based on the assumption of, of pseudo-independence between sites. But what we can do then is if we can approximate the genotype probabilities, we can then in turn compute the fitness of a lineage, Fn, by marginalizing over all possible genotypes that that lineage could be in. So for example, if we want to compute the fitness of uh, lineage N, we can simply sum over all possible genotypes in genotype space uh, and weight each uh, the fitness of each genotype by the approximate probability that that lineage is in that genotype. So since we're marginalizing over uh, all possible genotypes, that's why we call this model the, the marginal fitness birth death model. Uh, so, 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 let me just digest that a little bit. I mean, it's not, this is not like a quote unquote additive fitness model because the FG can be arbitrary, but you're 
is the point is the ancestral states you'd want to keep track of all the correlation the possible correlations there could be between the ancestral states yeah that's the exact point the, the exact reason why we're doing this um i think we always had it in trouble trying to justify the independence assumption um the independence assumption between sites but we're not assuming that um sites have independent fitness effects uh they for example can have there could be any arbitrary mapping between um, the fitness effects of each site and the overall fitness of a lineage. Um, we just need some way of roughly approximating uh, the probability of um, a lineage being in some particular genotype. Okay, uh, okay. cool, I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then so under the marginal fitness birth death model, we can then write down uh, a new system of ordinary differential equations for the probability density of a particular lineage n evolving as observed in the phylogeny, um, conditional on that lineage being in a particular state i at each site k. Um, and this leads to a slightly more complicated system of ODEs. The important thing to note here is that um, the birth rates of each lineage uh, is scaled by the overall uh, marginal fitness of the lineage. So we're incorporating the fitness effects of multiple different mutations in the overall fitness of a particular lineage. Um, but the important point here is that this allows us to consider how uh, selection is shaping molecular evolution at a bunch of different sites, while at the same time considering how mutations uh, act together at many different sites to, to shape the overall fitness of, of a lineage. Um, so just in summary here to compare these two different models, what we are starting with is the multi-type birth death model, where in this model we calculate the probability density DNI of a particular lineage or subtree uh, and the states observed at the tips. And now what we're doing is um, calculating the probability density DNKI of for the probability density of a particular lineage or subtree given a particular sites in the alignment. Um, but in order to do this, we need to make um, this series of approximations. The main one being, again, that we can compute genotype probability densities simply, simply by multiplying um, the probability of um, the lineage being in each state at each particular site. OK, so that was a lot of theory. Um, the cool thing about this approach is that it actually seems to work relatively well. So we've tested out this approach on many, many different simulated data sets here. So we would uh, simulate uh, a phylogeny and sequence data at the tips. And each mutation in the sequence data was assumed to have some uh, predetermined fitness effect that we then try and estimate from uh, the phylogeny without necessarily knowing the ancestral states. So the ancestral states uh, are inferred uh, along with the fitness effects in, in our approach. And what we can see is that regardless of how many sites we have in our alignment, um, we can pretty accurately estimate the fitness effects of um, mutations at particular sites. So the posterior median fitness effect that we infer using a Bayesian MCMC algorithm is always highly correlated with the, the true fitness effect that we put into um, the simulations. And these correlations are pretty strong um, with fewer sites, but you can see that as we increase the number of sites higher and higher to like 10 sites, the correlation between um, our estimated fitness effects and the true fitness effects does weaken and we think that this is largely due to the fact that as we include more and more sites in the alignment, basically the complexity of the genetic background in which we're considering the effects of particular mutations increases. And so um, single mutations are always going to fall in genetic backgrounds containing other uh, mutations. And so it's hard to estimate the fitness effects of particular mutations um, the more and more complex the genetic background occurs. Can, can you explain what is the form of the fitness here that we're looking at? The form of the fitness? Um, so yeah. here we're inferring that the, we're estimating the site-specific fitness effects of um, a bunch of different mutations. 
Um, but fitness effects were assumed to be uh, multiplicative across sites in, in these simulations. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we'll consider more complex uh, fitness uh, fitness architectures at the end of the talk. Uh, yeah, that's useful. I'm a little so, but this is so. You said that the reason why that it get, looks not as good for ten is because the background there's sort of a lot of variation in what the background. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, so particular mutations are always going to be uh, correlated um, with other mutations. That is, they're going to share the same uh, phylogenetic ancestry. And so it becomes more and more difficult to infer the fitness effects or to disentangle the fitness effects of particular mutations when um, mutations fall on the same genetic background. OK, um, so we've also applied these marginal fitness birth death models to uh, real empirical data sets, um, mostly of, of, of RNA viruses so far. So for example, um, we apply our model to estimate the fitness effects of particular amino acid substitutions that occurred um, in Ebola virus during the West Africa epidemic that occurred between 2014 and 2016. Um, and I think this is a really cool case study um, because there was this earlier study um, that was published in Cell back in 2016 by Urbanowitz and all, where they looked at all these naturally occurring um, amino acid substitutions in the glycoprotein of Ebola. And so the glycoprotein of Ebola is really what allows the virus to bind to human cells and enter the cells. And so the idea here is that um, Ebola virus was uh, adapted to entering um, other non-human primate cells, but during the human Ebola epidemic, the virus had to basically uh, adapt to enter human cells, and it largely adapted through, um, through these um, particular, particular amino acid substitutions in the glycoprotein. Um, and the really scary thing I find about this study is that they see that there's all kinds of different glycoprotein mutations um, that dramatically increase the ability of the virus to uh, infect cells uh, in vitro. So for example, this A82V mutation in the glycoprotein increases the fitness of the virus in cell culture um, almost twofold. Uh, which is a quite a dramatic fitness effect of just a single amino acid substitution. So what we wanted to see was what the population level fitness effects of these same mutations were, are, uh, were on the transmission rate of the virus. Did this AA2V mutation, for example, also increase uh, basically the transmission rate of the, the virus in the human population? So what we did is we um, took a large number of samples of Ebola virus that were collected during the epidemic and reconstructed um, molecular phylogenies. And then we used our marginal fitness birth death model to try and estimate the fitness effects of these particular mutations. And when we map the fitness effects of these mutations or the fitness of these genotypes onto the molecular phylogeny of Ebola, then we can get uh, a real picture for how the virus was able to uh, adapt to the human population during the epidemic. So very early on, there was this A82V mutation. This was the same mutation that Urbanowitz and all estimated to uh, double the infectivity of the virus in cell culture. We also estimate that this mutation increased the population level fitness of the virus, but to a far less dramatic degree. So we estimate that this uh, mutation increased the fitness relative to um, the wild type virus uh, or the genotype circulating in the human population at the beginning of the epidemic by only about 5% rather than uh, a 200% increase. Um, and this our finding that these mutations had a far less dramatic impact on fitness is actually consistent with some other work that came out on Ebola virus at the same time as the Urbanowitz and all study. So there is this uh, other study by Gil and all that also estimated um, the impact of this A82V mutation. Um, on Ebola fitness in humans, but what they did is instead of measuring uh, fitness in cell culture, they estimated the uh, fitness in terms of 
uh, viral load or viremia of these two different viruses carrying these two different amino acids. And what they found is that the V82 mutation does, in fact, increase the fitness or the vi vi viral load of Ebola in human patients. It's a bit confusing here because this actually has a lower value on the y-axis, but what the y-axis here is are the, um, the cycle threshold numbers from qPCR assays indicating that the viral load of these uh, of, of patients with the V82 mutation was actually higher than the patients carrying the A82 uh, allele. So our fitness estimates of the 82V mutation are actually consistent with what Dillenol estimated in terms of the fitness of these effects in terms of, of viral load. Um, other Wait, interest, oh, sorry. How do you convert your numbers into viral load? I mean, like, it seems like different units, right? Yeah, they're completely different units, and that, that's, that's a really excellent point. So what the fitness values that we're estimating from the phylogeny are always the, the population level fitness effects. So when we apply this to a viral phylogeny of, of viral samples collected from many different patients, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're estimating the, the fitness of the virus in terms of its, um, its growth rate in the human, human population. Um, or in our case, we, we assume the death rate or the removal rate is constant, but we allow mutations to basically rescale. The, the transmission rate. And so our population level fitness always reflects the transmission rate of these viruses in the human population. Uh, what Dillenol estimated is um, how these mutations affect uh, viremia in, in, in patients. And I guess what the argument that I'm trying to make is that uh, viremia or the viral load of patients should be a better proxy for population level fitness uh, than the fitness effects of these mutations measured just in, in, in cell culture as the Branowitz and all do. So the fact that our estimates are consistent with the deal and all estimates uh, likely reflects that the, the fitness effects that we're estimating at the population level effect does reflect something real about the, the biology of these mutations within hosts. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you don't I, buy it, we could, uh, If you don't buy that, we can we can discuss more. Um, no, I mean it's it just seems a little bit tough because, I mean, it's, I mean a short answer. It is like, I mean they are different units, but you're looking at sort of proportional change, right? Yeah. So everything here is measured in relative fitness, relative to some uh, ancestral genotype. Whoops. But it just seems like you're there's not that many points with which to absolutely uh, you know to convert things into an, a relative scale. Like there's some there's one or there's like maybe that little yellow cluster that goes up in fitness, and then the blue cluster that goes down. Fitness. Yeah. So overall, we considered the fitness effects of. Um, nine different mutations, which basically clustered into eight distinct genotypes because some of the mutations uh, only occur together in particular genetic backgrounds. Um, so yeah, we really only have eight estimates of uh, genotype fitness at the population level. Um, but for each of these eight estimates, our estimates of population level fitness are consistent with the sign of the effect that Urbano et al. estimated. So we don't really know enough, I would say, to say much about how fitness effects within hosts or at the cell level really scale to population level fitness. Um, but in terms of the, the, the sign of the fitness effect, our estimates at the population level are consistent with what Urbano et al. estimated. Um, and this holds true for other mutations as well. So there is this P30, P330S mutation that occurred up in this small lineage up here. Uh, and we estimate that this decreased fitness by about 7 or 8%. And what's interesting is that Urbano et al. estimated that this uh, same mutation decreased fitness as well. Um, but then along this lineage, there's uh, these two mutations that basically occur simultaneously uh, along this lineage. 
Um, and these two mutations together seem to rescue the fitness of this lineage, uh, which is also consistent with what Urbano has not estimated. Um, and then here, down here at the, the bottom of the tree, there is these two mutations. Um, that it's actually the same mutation that occurs twice, but they both occur in the same background as this R410S mutation. And Urbano has not estimated that there was an epistatic interaction between uh, this 410 mutation and this 439E mutation uh, that increased the fitness of these mutations uh, as well. So if we go back to uh, the previous slides, we can try and find that mutation. It's this AAT410SK439E mutation. And we can see that that had a relatively large um, impact on fitness. Um, it was highly beneficial uh, when the K4039E mutation um, occurred in the same background as uh, 410S. But you can see that the 410S mutation doesn't really have a large impact on fitness by itself. Um, and we've estimated the same thing at the population level, which is kind of interesting. Uh, R410S doesn't seem to have any real effect on population level of fitness until this uh, K4039E mutation occurs along the same lineage. Cool. Yeah, good. Sorry, did you have a question, Eric? No, that, that sounds good. I mean, I guess, well, now that you've asked, I just want to, so the, like, the sampling times are are fixed and sort of for the tip sequences are fixed and put in the model. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's sort of interesting and important, right? Because, like, the amount of diversification the fact that you're sort of sampling and then stopping, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the point at which you can, you no longer sample is important. Yeah, but for the, the Ebola epidemic, we, we sampled pretty much through the entire epidemic yeah. into 2016. And really, by this point, it's not labeled as 2016, but here would be about where 2016 is. The, the Ebola epidemic had pretty much stopped. So we were, we were sampling over the course of the entire epidemic. Now, it is the case that we might have been sampling differentially across different geographic locations. Right, okay, but I wasn't gonna ask you about that, but that's fine. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it, I don't wanna take you too far off track. Well, we did actually, um, we did try and uh, incorporate additional geographic fitness effects into this model. We basically treated uh, the geographic location of each lineage as if it was kind of like an additional site in our model that could have a fitness impact. But we didn't uh, estimate that geographic, the geographic location of the lineages really had a big impact on, on population level fitness. Um, yeah, so the uh, Ebola case is interesting, but it's only a really small number of mutations and there there arguably really hasn't been that much adaptation um, in the Ebola population to the human host population. So we also wanted to consider a case where there's been much more adaptive evolution going on for, for much longer. So we've also recently applied um, our marginal fitness birth death model to the case of uh, influenza. Um, specifically influenza um, A subtype H3N2, which is the, the seasonal strain that circulates in the human population. And this provides perhaps a much uh, better case to sort of compare and contrast fitness effects that we estimate at the population level versus um, the cellular level because there's been a, a series of studies now by um, Jesse's, Jesse Bloom's lab where they've tried to estimate the fitness effects of um, basically every possible amino acid substitution in the hemagglutinin protein of the virus using this reverse genetics approach known as um, deep mutational scanning. So this was a paper published in PNAS last year by Julie Lee and all where they estimated uh, the relative preference for every single amino acid in the hemagglutinin um, protein. And we, what we wanted to do then is for um, 
the subset of these amino acid substitutions that actually occur naturally in the human population is to try and estimate, again, the population level fitness effects of these mutations and compare those to what um, Lee and all estimated in vitro using deep mutational scanning. Um, so, sort of full disclosure, um, we did not find there to be a very strong correlation in this particular case between what was estimated using deep mutational scanning and the fitness effects that we estimated at the population, population level uh, using our uh, marginal fitness effect models. Interestingly, both methods sort of estimate that a large number of these mutations are basically uh, neutral. So neutral mutations have a fitness of, of one in, in our approach, but they would have a, a fitness of, of zero because it's the, the log ratio of effects in, in, uh, in the deep mutational scanning uh, approach that we're, we're looking at. Um, but I wouldn't really place too much weight on the fitness effects that we estimated for um, these influenza mutations because we, again, run into the problem of the fact that a lot of these amino acid substitutions are occurring in really complex genetic backgrounds. And so basically co-occur with the same phylogenetic ancestry as other mutations. We can see this by looking at what I call the co-ancestry matrix, which for each uh, pair of mutations gives the, the frequency uh, which um, two mutations are reconstructed to basically uh, co-occur along a particular lineage in the phylogeny. So you can see that um, most mutations sort of co-occur uh, with many other mutations at, at multiple sites. And this gives rise to um, this identifi identifiability problem sort of uh, akin to the classic problem of collinearity in a regression type model where you basically have um, multiple highly correlated variables and it's pretty much uh, statistically impossible to disentangle um, the individual effect of each uh, variable or in our case the fitness effect of each uh, mutation since they always sort of uh, co-occur or uh, share uh, phylogenetic ancestry in, in our models. Um, but we did a second analysis, which I still think was uh, somewhat illuminating because we could, uh, even though we couldn't estimate the fitness effects of um, site-specific mutations for influenza, or at least we found it to be rather difficult, we could still try and estimate um, the fitness effects of particular lineages in the H3N2 phylogeny. So we considered the second analysis where instead of trying to estimate site-specific fitness effects from the phylogeny, what we did is we basically took the fitness effects estimated by Lee and all using deep mutational scanning as basically um, our best guess predictor for uh, what the fitness effects of those mutations would be. And so we uh, combined the fitness effects of mutations uh, across sites into um, an overall predictor of the fitness of each lineage, which we call uh, theta DMS. And so what theta DMS is basically, oops, it's the sum of the log fitness effects, sort of the log uh, change uh, preference ratio for two amino acids at a given site. Um, and then using our marginal fitness birth death models, what we can do is we can estimate the scaling relationship or the mapping between uh, the fitness effects measured through deep mutational scanning and their population level fitness effects. And what we find um, is that relatively large changes in um, the preference for a particular amino acid. Um, so if we, we, if we change from a, a much less preferred amino acid to a much greater, greater preferred amino acid, population level fitness doesn't increase that much. Um, but when we aggregate mutations across multiple different sites into this composite measure of fitness, um, we can still see that fitness across the viral phylogeny uh, varies dramatically. Um, so there's lineages with fitness as low as sort of 0 0.8, 
where again, this is relative fitness um, compared to sort of the wild type gen genetic background where we would not consider uh, any mutations or that lineage to have any mutations. Then there's also lineages with uh, relatively high fitness of um, about a fitness advantage of uh, 5%. Um, interestingly, a lot of these mutations seem to carry a, a medium or, or mild deleterious mutation load, indicating they have multiple deleterious mutations. Um, and this is interesting with respect to H3N2 because uh, it's been sort of thought or predicted multiple times in the literature that um, it's not just the effects of uh, antigenic mutations that determine the fitness of a particular uh, viral lineage, but it's really the combined effects of the antigenic mutations that they carry together with the effects of um, deleterious mutations that occur in the genetic background that determines which lineages ultimately survive over time. Sorry, can you just say a little bit more about what is the parameterization here? I mean, I, I was like, I followed that there's, you're, you're taking the DMS results and you, those go in and they're used to estimate a population level fitness, but I mean, how many parameters are, are you, what are you estimating here? Oh yeah, so sorry, there's, um, so we have our composite measure of um, what the predicted fitness should be based off of the um, just the DMS, yeah, the DMS, um, which is just the additive log effects of each individual amino acid substitution. And then what we have, although it's not shown here, is a model that basically rescales uh, this data DMS to a population level fitness, and that model, sorry, has two uh, parameters, and I should have shown it on this model, but basically there's a, there's a linear scaling parameter um, that basically determines the slope of this line. Uh, and then there was also a scaling exponent, which could allow um, there to be some nonlinear relationship between theta DMS and population level fitness. And the line that I've plotted here is sort of our best guess estimate. Um, it shows this scaling relationship for uh, the parameter values of this model that had the highest uh, posterior probability. And what we estimated was that um, population level fitness increases with changes to more preferred amino acids, basically with this slope. But there doesn't appear to be any curvature in this, in this slope. So we estimated that the scaling exponent on this, this model was pretty close to, to, to zero. Okay. Sorry, close to one. <laughs> uh, and then so for each lineage in the viral phylogeny, what we can do is then we can run theta DMS through our, 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 our fitness mapping function to get a population level fitness for that lineage. And that's what I've plotted on top of this, this, this phylogeny. Right, okay. All right. And the point is there seems to be like little correlation here between like this estimated fitness and the actual branching structure? Well, I, so, no, it's interesting that you say that. I, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely clades of virus that seem to have relatively uh, low population level fitness, but still branch a lot in the phylogeny. Um, but there's other uh, lineages that do seem to have high fitness, and these are the lineages that actually sort of um, survive or, or persist over, over time. Um, although, if, yeah, I guess if you... Well, wait a minute, like that yellow lineage dies off, right? It does. Um, I guess it would be interesting to look at this over a longer period of time and, and look at sort of the backbone of the phylogeny, which lineages ultimately persist over time. Here we're only looking at it over the course of like four or five years um, because we only wanted to um, use viruses in the same antigenic cluster as the, the viral genotype that uh, Lee and all considered to do the deep mutational scanning experiments um, because their fitness effects wouldn't really, that they measured in vitro wouldn't really incorporate uh, the fitness effects of antigenic mutations because they're doing everything in cell culture. Uh, so we wanted to minimize the amount of uh, antigenic fitness variation in the phylogeny by just looking at a single antigenic cluster of the virus. 
Um, but you're absolutely right, Eric. It would be really interesting to look, look at uh, a much larger uh, influenza phylogeny over a longer period of time and see if it's actually uh, the higher fitness viruses um, that actually form the, the backbone of the phylogeny and persist over time. Okay, cool. I was just checking in. Thanks. Yeah. No, it's good that you're being critical of my uh, hand waving explanations of the results. Um, I, I just thought mainly thought it was it was cool because um, even within an antigenic cluster, we see all of this fitness variation across lineages, and that's what's been previously predicted to really determine what lineages survive and what don't is this background. Uh, genetic variation and fitness due to deleterious mutations. And that's exactly what we're, we're seeing here, I think, as well, um, that there are large fitness differences between different uh, viral lineages. It, it appears, though, that maybe these, these fitness differences are, are still on a relatively small scale, and they, they're not having a large impact on the evolutionary dynamics of what actually um, persist between years here, or which, which viral clades actually expand or not. OK, so um, that was the, the marginal fitness per death model. If you're interested in reading more about this, this model and some of the technical details, um, this work hasn't been published yet, but uh, we have a copy of the, the manuscript online um, at BioArchive. Bio um, and this is the URL if you want to go find. Um, the, the manuscript. Um, the methods have been implemented in the BEAST2 phylogenetic uh, package. It's basically an add-on package. Uh, we call it Lumiere to go along with the theme of um, characters from, from Beauty, and, Beauty and the Beast in the BEAST2 environment. Um, and having this model implemented in uh, BEAST is nice because then we can do inference in sort of this joint uh, Bayesian framework where we can estimate or co-estimate the phylogeny along with all the fitness effects in our, our fitness model. But I have to admit that it's quite um, computationally burdensome, especially as we consider long, larger phylogenies with more sites. Um, it can take quite a long time to run this, these MCMC analyses. For example, the Ebola analysis with just nine sites in a phylogeny of 1,600 samples took almost 10 days. To, to, to run, to, to reach convergence. Um, so what we've been trying to do, um, and what recent work in my lab has, has focused on, is um, trying to develop a, a higher performance or, or faster uh, phylogenetic uh, modeling framework to try and fit some of these models using what we call uh, generalized fitness birth death models. And uh, I see that we're, we're coming up on about one hour, so I'll try and go through um, this final section in just four or five minutes. Um, so the basic idea here is that generally for, for pathogens or any organism, we have a whole bunch of um, characters, which could be molecular sequence characters or other evolving uh, characters like phenotypes, or it could even be sort of the environment in which a particular um, organism lives in. And we like to use these, these character features to predict the overall fitness of an organism. Um, but how we actually go from the low level genotype features to um, organismic level or population level fitness uh, is unclear. Um, it's sort of a black box to us. It's nothing less than the, the genotype, phenotype map that you know, most of biologists have been trying to figure out uh, ever since the, the, the dawn of genetics at the beginning of last century. So what we would like is some flexibility in the types of um, mapping functions that we use to translate uh, genotypes or other character states into population level fitness. Uh, and we call this approach the, the generalized, uh, we call this generalized fitness uh, birth death models, um, because really it would allow us to consider any sort of arbitrary uh, mapping function between genotype and phenotype. But what we're hoping to do is come up with a framework that really allows us to um, take the best of sort of two different statistical uh, worlds. So we're hoping to be able to continue to use likelihood-based phylogenetic inference to estimate the parameters of our birth-death models, 
but maybe combine this likelihood-based inference with more computationally efficient tools and algorithms from the machine learning community, community to actually learn how pathogen features, including their genotypes, actually map to population level fitness. And so the framework that we've been developing in the lab here is built on um, the, the TensorFlow package that was developed by um, Google for machine learning applications and is particularly uh, deep learning applications using neural networks. And many of you have probably some heard of TensorFlow by now, if, if not um, even maybe played around with it y y yourself. But what TensorFlow allows us to do is basically um, specify some model that we'd like to, to train on, on real data. But all we have to do is basically set up the model. And then what TensorFlow does under the, the hood is figure out all of the computational operations that we um, need to be able to do in order to uh, uh, train that model. And then it's based on this model of delayed distributed, distributed computation, where it basically builds a computational graph for all of the operations that we need to be able to do to, to train the model. And then that computational graph can then be pushed to, say, like a cluster of CPUs or even GPUs to actually do the hardcore computation. So it is sort of it kind of relieves the end user of the need to actually figure out how to distribute all of the computational operations across multiple different um, nodes in a, in a cluster. Um, so we can use the TensorFlow architecture to also do uh, phylogenetic inference. Here I've shown an example where we've taken a very simple phylogeny of just three samples converted it into a TensorFlow-like um, object, uh, where basically what we have is different nodes in our tree as different nodes in the computational graph that TensorFlow is then going to compute on. And what TensorFlow flow does is it allows us to basically transfer different uh, data arrays between different nodes in the graph. Um, these data arrays are what TensorFlow is called tensors, but they're just multidimensional data arrays. And so what we can do by passing um, data arrays between different nodes in our phylogeny is we can actually pass um, the probabilities that we need to compute the likelihood of a phylogeny between different nodes in our graph all the way back to the root of the tree. So we can actually compute the likelihood of a phylogeny in TensorFlow. And then once we have that likelihood, we can, for example, compute um, gradients uh, uh, that likelihood in, in likelihood space. So we can then, can then use approaches like uh, gradient descent algorithms to try and uh, estimate the parameters of our, our phylogenetic model. Um, so we've implemented this using TensorFlow's high-level Python API. And this is just a, a simple example of how just in a few lines of code, you can basically set up one of these uh, phylogenetic models and, and train it. On, on real data in, in, in Python. So basically, we just have to um, convert our phylogenetic tree into uh, a tensor-like object that TensorFlow can actually convert into a computational graph. We then have to specify some birth-death model that we actually want to use for phylogenetic inference. Um, and then we would have to specify some fitness model, which is actually the model that we want to train um, that translates the features, such as pathogen genotypes into to the fitness of particular lineages. Uh, and finally, then we have to set up some sort of uh, loss function that we want to optimize. What we're doing here is just trying to optimize um, the likelihood of our tree under our birth-death model. And then we can pass this loss function to some optimizer, uh, which then trains the actual model. We're using um, the Atom optimizer here, which is a, a variant of the more general gradient descent algorithm. And that's pretty much it. So we can uh, set up this model in just a few lines of code and then uh, run it. And it runs really, really quickly. Um, things that would have taken weeks to run in Beast can be run in a couple minutes in TensorFlow. Uh, so that that's really nice. Um, and so we've uh, used this approach to go back and look at the, the fitness effects of more uh, mutations in the influenza genome. Um, so here we use uh, still a relatively simple linear additive model for fitness. Basically, we assume that the fitness of each lineage um, 
is equal to uh, some seasonally varying transmission rate plus the additive effects of mutations at all sites. So we infer uh, basically um, scaling coefficients for the fitness effect of each mutation at each site, K, plus uh, a random fitness effects for, for each lineage in the, the pathogen phylogeny to take into account um, essentially background variation in the, the fitness of these lineages. And so we can take this fitness model and we can actually uh, train it by using TensorFlow to actually uh, estimate the best parameterization of this model based on, by trying to uh, maximize the, the log likelihood of this phylogeny. Uh, and so we can do this and we can estimate fitness effects for each individual mutation. Um, I'm not actually trying to highlight our estimates of the fitness effects of these individual mutations here, because um, we, again, don't see that basically our estimates from the phylogeny don't particularly correspond too well with the, their fitness effects from the deep mutational scanning experiments. Um, but just the fact that we can take this sort of approach, we can estimate the fitness effects of a very large number of mutations from an empirical phylogeny very quickly um, using our generalized uh, fitness birth death models. And in the future, we could even potentially extend the fitness mapping function to include um, much more uh, complex um, interactions among sites, or maybe even the effects of global fitness on how these mutations uh, impact the, the fitness of individual lineages in the tree. Um, and so with that, I'll wrap it up. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Tanya Stadler again, who is my postdoc advisor at ETH. Um, she really helped me out a lot with um, formulating the, the marginal fitness birth death model and, and getting it working. Um, and also uh, my new group here at NC State, who's been sort of uh, moving stuff forward in, in advancing um, uh, these uh, these fitness models and or the the birth death models and applying them to new data sets. And thanks everybody for listening out there. Thank you. Um, I um, that's all very interesting and cool. Um, I let's see. I've got a bunch of questions. I'm afraid. Um, so with respect to the TensorFlow, so what's interesting is you sort of shifted from a Bayesian perspective to a likelihood-based one, if I understand correctly. Yeah. So um, basically what we can do using the computational architecture of TensorFlow is compute phylogenetic likelihoods very, very quickly by uh, converting our phylogenies into a computational graph that TensorFlow can work on. I don't know about that. So my like our experience with TensorFlow is if you can calculate gradients directly using like a like using using a, just a regular dynamic program, that it's faster to compute those directly rather than using TensorFlow. But I mean, the the part that seems difficult to evaluate is the birth death model side of things. So actually, so I forgot to mention. Uh, a critical part of how we're simplifying everything here uh, to use TensorFlow. So in the in the Bayesian approach, we're doing joint inference of the parameters of our fitness model and the phylogeny, and we're also considering uncertainty in the ancestral states. Um, right. But what we're doing here in this TensorFlow implementation of these birth death models is um, we first uh, sort of estimate our best guess of the ancestral state reconstructions. And once we do that, it's actually possible to compute the likelihood of the phylogeny under uh, a multi-type birth death model with uh, fixed ancestral states along each lineage. And that can actually be done as just a, a series of uh, linear algebraic operations. Uh, they're really big matrices on big trees, but TensorFlow has a great built-in uh, linear algebra library that can actually be parallelized across uh, nodes without any sort of uh, finicking around on your part trying to figure out how to distribute those operations among different GPUs or, or CPUs. And so we found that TensorFlow speeds things up dramatically, but I haven't tested this admittedly against sort of 
Um, and then, I mean, so, but you've changed things. I mean, you're now you're looking at a joint estimation problem of of the ancestral states and the likelihood. Yeah, and so in tensor in the TensorFlow implementation, we actually fix our best guess of the ancestral states that were so sort of. I mean, that's a fundamentally different problem. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Um, I guess. I guess what we've sort of thought about is that continuing to do everything in this admittedly nice statistically framework of sort of joint Bayesian inference of everything using AMCMC is going to be basically computationally prohibitively costly for some of the harder problems that we'd like to apply these models to. So for example, trying to estimate the fitness effects of all naturally occurring amino acid substitutions in the uh, hemagglutin and protein. Um, so we've made, I guess, a series of simplifying assumptions. One of them is here that we can um, reconstruct the ancestral states first and then uh, use uh, TensorFlow to, um, to uh, train the, the mapping function between the genotypes and the population level fitness. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't think it was correct to say that it's that it's TensorFlow is making things up, I, I'm making things faster. I think it's your simplifying assumption that's making things faster. But anyway, definitely, definitely. Although, I mean, the one, I guess, I think the a lot of people are using TensorFlow more and more for just like general scientific computation because it does come with this like nice built-in. A uh, linear algebra library that can be very efficient. I don't know if it's more or less efficient than you know you're sort of doing the same computations in something that's been already optimized in, in C or Java. We haven't done those comparisons. Um, the nice feature about doing stuff in TensorFlow is that really it has these really fantastic built-in um, optimization routines, things like the atom gradient descent optimizer. Uh, which is really fantastic um, because uh, normally for gradient descent, this gradient descent algorithm, you'd have to be able to supply um, the gradients in the likelihood surface in terms of uh, derivatives or second derivatives. And what TensorFlow allows you to do is use um, automatic differentiation uh, to automatically figure out what those gradients are. And so you can sort of just supply some arbitrary likelihood function, like our generalized fitness birth death models. And TensorFlow will actually figure out how to compute the gradients on that likelihood function and optimize then the parameters of your model for you. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. That is, that it's definitely convenient. Um, so the, skipping back to the earlier part of the talk, um, the, can you, so we had Richard Nair on before, and he also has a framework uh, that is in terms of ODEs. I mean, I, I think they have a fixed death rate, but they also have a birth rate that sort of propagates according to an ODE. Can you compare your framework to his and what, what this, I mean, obviously you're in a Bayesian framework um, and they were where you're sort of sampling these parameters, at least in the first part of the talk. And he's not, but what else is there that is sort of interesting that distinguishes the two approaches? So I tuned in relatively, uh, well, early and late for, for Richard's seminar last uh, week, so I didn't get to see all of it. Um, but I am familiar with some of his uh, recent work on um, using these uh, birth death models that basically have like a, a fitness propagating function along lineage. And, those allow you to estimate the fitness effects or the fitness of particular lineages in uh, a, a phylogeny. Um, but as far as I know, um, and let me let me say that I think Richard's framework is is really nice and was the inspiration for some of this work. But as far as I know, uh, Richard's framework doesn't allow um, the fitness of individual lineages in the phylogeny be to be coupled with the genotype of lineages. So it doesn't really allow us to estimate uh, the fitness effects of particular mutations. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, in my limited understanding, I believe that to be correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, and maybe Richard uh, has something new now that allows him to estimate fitness effects of, of particular genotypes or mutations. But uh, in his original uh, birth death framework, which was um, published a few years ago, I think in in eLife, he's really only considering the fitness of entire entire lineages. So it's kind of actually completely uncoupled from um, molecular evolution. Right. Cool. Um, and can you just say a couple words about extinct lineages, which I don't think appear in your framework? Uh, we actually do. I just sort of uh, glossed over it or maybe completely forgot to Oh, mention. right. I see them there. Well, there's, a, there's an extinct lineage. I focused on computing the probability density of the observed part of the tree. Um, but along any particular lineage, we always have to take into account that a particular lineage might have given birth to another lineage that wasn't sampled uh, or it, that died out before it was sampled. Um, and so we do have to take into account what we call these E probabilities, which are the probability of a lineage going uh, unsampled or, or unobserved. Um, and so in Tanya's original multi-type birth death framework, she actually has a completely different set of um, ordinary, ordinary differential equations to track how these E probabilities of no sample descendants evolving backwards through time. Um, and for our marginal fitness birth death models, because we have to consider how um, the genotype of an entire lineage would affect its fitness, we have to make some farther approximation of how these E probabilities evolve backwards in time under our model. And we've tried many different things, but actually uh, a relatively simple approach that seems to work well is just to say that um, at any particular time, we can take our best guess for what the fitness of a particular lineage is, is and then we can calculate this E probability of no sample descendants, uh, assuming that um, basically any unobserved lineages that that Lineage, the observed lineage gave rise to has that same fitness uh, of the lineage, but that the fitness of that lineage, of those unobserved lineages, don't evolve farther through time. So it's basically that there's no, there's no fitness changes in the unobserved parts of the phylogeny. And so that's a huge simplifying assumption, but it seems to work relatively well. Um, and that same assumption has been uh, incorporated into other birth death uh, modeling frameworks as well. Like that's the assumption that BAM is based on as, as well. So that's for a lineage that has, I'm just trying to understand, that's for, that's looking at relatives of a lineage that has a sampled descendant. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so what the E probability represents is the probability that if a sample lineage that we're walking along gave rise to any descendants, that descendant lineage was not sampled itself, and that any of its descendants, its farther descendants, was also not sampled. So basically, it's the probability of uh, a lineage producing no sample descendants, either because they all died or because none of them were sampled. And this means that you don't have to explicitly do MCMC over those extinct lineages? You don't, which is one of the key, really nice features about Tanya's original multi-type birth death model that we've sort of translated over into our new marginal fitness birth death models, uh, considering multiple evolving sites. Okie doke. Well, um, that's all very interesting. I think I asked so many questions that nobody else wanted to ask questions, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for having me again. It was, it was yeah, yeah, thank I you. I really appreciate uh, all the questions because otherwise it's just like talking like a crazy person into your computer screen. For, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. Uh, let's see, I guess our next talk should be from Benjamin Good um, in a bit. and. Um, Looking forward to that. Hopefully, we'll get Sebastian back on as well. All right, see you for now. Thanks, Eric.